It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in person again, and uh, thank you for coming early on a Sunday morning. We're going to start with a video to wake everyone up. It's a three-minute video that summarizes the first 18 months of construction of SAM, which is our hermetically sealed, which means pressurized uh, habitat that we've been constructing at the Biosphere 2, and then I'll move into the, uh, the more formal presentation. So enjoy. Let's see if this works. Uh, we're now at about six zero zero parts per million. Just before we, we dive into the details, I want to share everything you saw in that presentation, in that video, uh, was done over the course of 18 months with volunteers from about four different countries. We had 20 volunteers during the, the, the heat of uh, COVID. We did very well in terms of uh, the ways in which we managed that. And we did all of that for $168,000. And so we're very pleased with, uh, <clears throat> with what we've accomplished. The, uh, the contributions, the financial contributions came from uh, the University of Arizona and from a private donor, and uh, those are continuing to roll in, which is fantastic. We now have enough funds to, uh, to complete our effort through the rest of this year, which, as I will share in the presentation, will bring us to a fully functional hermetically sealed analog by the close of uh, 2022. So again, this is Sam, a space analog for the moon and Mars at Biosphere 2. I'm going to give you just a brief history of analogs and, what's, and the role that they have played throughout the history of human space exploration. And uh, then we'll talk, we'll work into what we're doing specifically. <clears throat> so the question that we fundamentally ask ourselves repeatedly is, what does it take for a species to become interplanetary? That's the question all of us are asking here today and throughout this conference. It's what Robert's been asking for many, many years, and we've been working to solve that question incrementally over the course of decades. 
This is a, is a, is a wonderful uh, artist rendering uh, by Brian Vierstig, and it gives us a sense of what we're shooting for. Maybe not the million person city yet, but maybe, and also maybe not the first tin can that we land on, the, on Mars, but something in the middle, a third or fourth generation habitat. But to get there, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of unknowns that we have to solve. And we use analogs here on Earth in order to solve many of those questions and to fill some of the knowledge gaps. So just a brief history. Most of you are probably aware of all the analogs, but I'll go through it anyway. So we've uh, started in the upper left-hand corner with the work of Gene Shoemaker and the Apollo astronauts at Meteor Crater. That was an outdoor or external um, analog. We have the uh, underwater, the neutral buoyancy lab at NASA. We have HERA and BIOS-3 and uh, the work down at the uh, Concordia station, High Seas, NEMO, Lunaris, and of course our favorite, the MDRS, the most famous and certainly the most well-known uh, of all the Mars analogs today. And here's just a brief list of the ones that, and there's probably more that I'm not aware of, but these are the brief, brief lists of the ones that are active or recently been active. Uh, those in italics are the ones that are pressurized and or sealed. And then we come to Biosphere 2. So Biosphere 2 is a very unique facility. It was the largest, certainly the most audacious attempt at a, uh, or I should say, effort in a sealed analog. And as if you look at some of the early renderings, the early artist renderings and the, the work that the uh, Biospherians did, it was much more geared towards how will we live on Mars. And over the course of their work as a team, over the course of that decade together, they really evolved the effort to becoming more about about how do we as humans interact with the world around us? What is the relationship between the humans and the ecosystem in which we live? And of course, they divided that ecosystem into specific biomes, some of which were directly responsible for their ability to eat and to, uh, to process the air, and other ones which were really test beds for the variety of plants that we might be able to bring someday to another planetary body. I do want to make a statement that is very, very important. Too much of the media, even today, 30 years later, uses the word failure with Biosphere 2. The word failure and experiments do not go in the same sentence or even the same paragraph. If you're conducting an experiment and you learn something, you didn't fail. Yes, they ran out of oxygen. That's part of the experiment. We'd rather run out of oxygen here on Earth and understand why than on Mars, where we don't have the ability to recover. So there were, there were some challenges, we learned from that, and it was an incredibly successful project. Um, I, in another talk with more time, I would go into the details of what was accomplished throughout that. Um, I can also answer questions after this, of course. So this is the agricultural space in which they grew all of their, uh, their fruits and vegetables for their food. Uh, this is the ocean as it, this is an older photograph, probably a couple of years ago. Uh, we've actually removed a lot of the algae since then uh, using both mechanical and biological means by introducing certain crabs. So there's a full ocean. It is the world, as far as I understand, the world's largest uh, enclosed saltwater research ocean. We have a full rainforest. Most of the plants here are the original plants from 30 years ago. They were two or three meters tall when they were introduced. They're now 90 feet tall, which is phenomenal, over 25, 26 meters tall. Now, this photograph is wonderful. This is 1987. This is the test module. This is the prototype, the second prototype. The first prototype became the gift shop. The second prototype uh, called the test module was used to test the function, the function of the sealed windows and the sealed system with a stainless steel welded floor. And, the bio, and this, was, this was about two or 300 meters away from the Biosphere 2 proper. So while Biosphere 2 was being built, this facility was being tested. And the Biospherians took turns living inside one person at a time, all of their air, food, water, and human waste fully recycled within a 400 square foot building, about 11,000 cubic feet total, including the lung. So this is the building that we started with. We had the, op we had the opportunity to take this 35 year old building and refurbish the building. So that's what we did from, to, from January, 2021 through, Ju through June, as you saw in the video. And so we had the opportunity to start with a very complex and otherwise very expensive building and spend that six months refurbishing it to getting it back into a fully pressurized state. Remarkably, it was in pretty good condition. For those of you who have lived in the desert, you know that the desert likes to move into buildings very quickly. So if, having been abandoned for about 20 years, we had to send an eviction notice to a number of creatures. Um, and we had to dig out a lot. We had to use a jackhammer and dig out a lot of soil that was in there. Um, this is the same facility today. And I won't have time to go into all the details of everything we've done. However, on our website, which is samb2.space, we have photo essays for every single step, usually two to three essays per week. There are thousands of photographs, over 110 essays. 
Everything we're doing is recorded. The science of it, the reason why we're doing it, the stories of, of the folks, the volunteers and our staff that are working on this. So we have a complete log, a really solid story of how and why we've accomplished this. So I just want to give some artist renderings because I, I haven't had yet a chance to fly a drone overhead or, or take a shot from an airplane. So this is the, the best way to give you the overview. On the bottom left-hand side, we have the original test module, and then we've added on a 20-foot in the center, a 20-foot shipping container, which is the workshop that will have a 3D printer, a sewing machine, a soldering bench, repair facilities, so you can both repair and create things while you're in SIM. And then we're looking at the end on the right-hand side of the 40-foot shipping container and the airlock. The airlock is a fully functional airlock. It will act as a pass-through airlock, meaning we'll pass air through so for a certain period of time because obviously we're not moving out into a vacuum. So it can't function as a proper airlock simply because we can't evacuate the air around it. And to the adjacent side of that, we have the uh, what was the uh, greenhouse for the rainforest. So in, if you had visited the biosphere in the early 90s, while the biospherians were inside, there was a botanical garden outside of the, uh, the biosphere proper in which you could go as a tourist and go through and see all the plants, all the animals and the functions that are inside, but on the outside. So we've completely refurbished this 6,400 square foot greenhouse, and that will become our indoor Mars yard. And just yesterday, I had the pleasure of meeting with Dr. Jim Bell, and he's helping guide our effort as to how to design that space to make certain it's as geologically correct as is possible given what we have here on Earth. So just the basic timeline is not going to read this to you, um, but where we are now, we're in phase three. And uh, just last week was our first week back. We always take the summers off. We have from now until the end of December and a little bit into January to complete the functions, uh, to complete this uh, construction process and bring it to a level of functionality for our first visiting teams. We have seven teams signed up for 2023 already. <clears throat> so the principal components, again, not going to read all this to you, but the really the, the key efforts, uh, most important thing is the movie theater. We've got to have a really good movie theater theater inside. Uh, we have a greenhouse, which is the controlled environment, the crew quarters, um, a kitchen, fully functional kitchen. We believe that food, as at MDRS, the kitchen is, is the center of the, of the uh, really the team experience. It's where we spend a lot of time together. It's how we cook together, which is very important. It's how we share our cultural differences through our food. We want to make certain that we have that quality of environment as well. Uh, we have a workshop, as I mentioned, um, because we are pressurized. Now, we're pressurized at approximately one-tenth of a PSI over ambient. Doesn't sound like much, but that's all we need to make certain that we are biologically sealed and we're not seeing contaminants coming in during the missions. Um, but to give you a sense of that, every 25, we have a number of windows. There's 16 windows, which are 25 square feet each. There's 360 pounds of pressure on each one of those windows. So even at one-tenth PSI, it's still a phenomenal pressure. It still is enough to pop your ears if you open the door quickly. Uh, we have an indoor Mars yard, an outdoor Mars yard, and uh, we use fully pressurized spacesuits, as you saw in the video. That was a prototype, a, an older model from three or four years ago that we were using just for that video. And uh, we now have two brand new spacesuits that were built by, uh, by aerospace, Smith Aerospace Garments out of Portland. And they've been tested at 70,000 feet underwater, cold chambers, vacuum chambers. It's the real thing. They're, they're highly functional and uh, very, very high quality suits. Um, and as we'll be talking about a little bit later, we are in integrating a full sensor array into a live uh, data feed in, in HAB that will also be working to do model validation uh, for later use within our model itself within CMOC, which as we'll be talking about next. So what does one do at SAM? What do people do at analogs? Um, perhaps this is the one conference that knows this better than any other, but I'll share with you a little bit of some of our science objectives. So we have five science objectives that are core to our team. It doesn't mean that if you come to SAM, you have to do these things. These are just things that we're excited about. You're, of course, welcome to bring what you would like to bring in or build on these. So we, as far as we know, we'll be the first analog to transition from physiochemical, meaning machine-based, to bioregeneration or plant-based life support systems. So some of the crews will come in and there will be nothing growing in the hydroponics or our small soil beds. We'll have a, we have a fully functional uh, zeolite-based CO2 scrubber today that we receive from Paragon Space Development Corporation. We're in the process of building a larger scale swing bed. Uh, we built a swing bed CO2 scrubber from the ground up last year with a five-person engineering capstone team from the University of Arizona fully functional. Most of the parts came from uh, Ace Hardware with a little bit of machining at the University of Arizona. Um, it's not, not rocket science, but I guess it could be rocket science. <laughs> Depends how far you want to take it. And so we will be building and, and operating a fully functional CO2 scrubber in which we can capture the CO2 and then pipe it into the greenhouse to release it to the plants again. 
Um, really, we're learning one of our fundamental foci is how do we close the air, food, and water cycles? And a study of the microbiome, we're working with the University of Arizona. They have a fabulous uh, microbiological study uh, program. And we're working with some of the experts there on doing uh, sampling of that microbiological environment and understanding how does it transition? How does it uh, transition and evolve over time with the movement of teams in and out of a built environment? We'll be test testing pressurized suits, tools, and procedures, as I shared. And again, advanced computer simulation with real-world model validation, which is the cornerstone of any scientific endeavor. Build your model, test it, gain new data, revise your model, test it, gain new data, et cetera. So CMOC is very much um, a cornerstone to this. So CMOC, as Ezio will talk about in the next call, um, is a agent-based model with both a uh, web interface, educational web interface, and a research backend uh, built on 40 years of NASA data. And uh, this was started right here at Arizona State University in 2017 with funding from the Interplanetary Initiative. Uh, and that was a project that I had uh, developed, and it's now funded by National Geographic and by Biosphere 2. And uh, we have some really exciting things, as you will tell us more about, including a live data feed and live interface inside of the habitat so that you as a team member will have a visualization of, of your quality of your air and quality of your water. Team research at SAM, as with all the analogs, there's such a variety. There's so many creative things. You look at what's happened at MDRS over the last 20 years, and there's so many incredible opportunities for, for teams to come in and, and really explore the variety and the depth and breadth of all the sciences, uh, you know, soils and hydroponics and aquaponics systems, uh, food production, CO2 sequestration, converting regolith to soil, um, human factors, tools, and haptics, et cetera, et cetera. So really wonderful. So we're looking forward to all the creativity and what will be brought in. Who can apply? University professors and their students, industrial professionals, analog astronauts with a clear science foundation, astronauts in training. Uh, my my uh, associate Trent Tresh and I have co-founded a center of excellence at the University of Arizona called the Center for Human Space Exploration. And Trent led the first emergency egress training class in the University of Arizona swimming pool. He strapped a parachute onto a, a, a a volunteer shoved him into the pool and he had to be able to un disconnect himself from the parachute harness, swim through the water and climb into uh, an actual life raft, which is similar to what the Navy uses for emergency egress from, from ships. So we're going to be doing a full astronaut training program at the University of Arizona, and this is just the beginning. And also we welcome artists, writers, filmmakers embedded in the teams. Uh, University of Arizona professor Christopher Kokinos has put together the first uh, all professor team from the University of Arizona, the artists, writers, and filmmakers. And they'll be coming uh, the first, second week of March uh, to Sam. So we're really excited to see what they come up with. So we're taking team applications now. And uh, I, before I go into this part, I also want to make it very clear that we don't see ourselves as competition to MDRS. Uh, Shannon Rupert, the director of MDRS, was, was really gracious in her support of us. She even sent her niece and Attila, uh, who's in the, uh, nie her niece is in the upper right-hand corner, Attila is in the upper center, from MDRS to help us last year in getting some of our foundation work done. Um, so we really appreciate that. We see ourselves as complementary and different from MDRS. There's room for everybody. So, so we please uh, please come and you know, come to our facility, go to MDRS, go to Lunaris. They're all unique facilities that offer something different uh, for the analog astronauts. We have had volunteers from all over the world, um, over 20, 25 volunteers to date, some of which have become my full-time staff members. So just sharing some of those folks on the upper right hand corner is John Adams, who's the deputy director of Biosphere, one of the probably the best person I've ever worked for. Absolutely just creative and, uh, and, and a good listener and, and pretty much says yes uh, all the time. If as long as you say, as he says to me every day, just don't kill yourself. You can just do what you need to do and get it done. And uh, so this is our current, uh, some of our current staff members and, and well, and, and we're happy to be working with, uh, with Anastasia and Anastasia will be helping us uh, throughout the next year as well. And I just want to close with a really unique story. Um, I would encourage any of you who have daughters or granddaughters or girlfriends or wives, give them power tools for Christmas. It's a surprising, you know, I mean, give power tools to everybody, but specifically to women. So this is Luna. Luna's 20 years old. She just graduated from high school about a year and a half ago. She's taking a gap year. She had not worked with power tools before. And she is now a rock star. She is fantastic. And she is just prolific with all of her skills and her capacity and her knowledge. And she is really instrumental in helping physically build this structure. And so I encourage all of my team members, if they don't know how to, 
to learn how to sketch, to use a notepad and paper, not because computers aren't necessary, but because they're not, they're not needed for rapid ideation, for getting those ideas out of your head and sharing with your colleagues. This is the fastest way. These are my sketches. Each one of these is about five minutes, three to five minutes. This is how we're designing and building our facility. We then translate these into the bare minimum necessary computer drawings to hand off to a welding team at the University of Arizona or to contractors who are coming in doing some of the work that we can't do, which is minimal. So I really encourage all of you to, to really, whenever possible, get people out of the digital world. The digital, the digital world is exciting, exciting, but it's, it's not, not the real world. world. Get them into the real world. Get them working with their hands. It gives people confidence. It, it, they, they stand different. They see the world different. They can fix their own car. They don't have to rely on mechanics. There's a lot of exciting things that come out of that. So. Um, and actually, this is what Luna then designed. So on her own, I said, we need sleeping pods. They need to be insulated. They need to be soundproof. Go. And so she did the research. She looked at some of the NASA functions, some of the things they've done, did their own measurements, did her own ergonomic studies. And she led the project and she built the prototype. She and, and my other uh, employee, John Z, built the, this is about three quarters of the way through the construction process. She did her own sketches in a notebook, went and bought all the materials at Home Depot and spent about two weeks putting together the first prototype. And it's awesome. It's really, really cool. So we'll have four of these pods stacked inside of the, the crew quarters. They're modular. We can move them around. And when you're inside that space, that's your personal space. So in closing, um, I've, I've said this many times now over the course of the last two years of, of working on this project, living on Mars tomorrow is how we should be living on Earth today. And what I mean by that is that we are aware of and appreciative of every breath of air we take, every drop of water, fresh water, which is becoming increasingly scarce on this planet, every drop of water, every bit of food. It means that we're not eating beef three times a day. We're probably going to be vegetarian right? Not for animal cruelty issues, not for those issues, but because of the incredible amount of resources that we waste on this planet on producing meat when the same amount of resources could feed eight to 10 times as many people. When we go to Mars, we're going to be living the way we should be living today, aware of our water, taking short showers. It's, it's even the things as, as MDRS has, has emphasized, they have a finite amount of water. That's all the water you get for the whole mission. Right? You have to be aware of how many showers you take and how many times you flush the toilet, et cetera. So I'd like to close with this, that our mission is to engage research teams from around the world in hands-on scientific discovery and to inspire the next generation to be engaged custodians of this planet while exploring new worlds. So thank you. I'll take any questions. Philosophically, if we must give up meat so that the population of Earth can rise by a factor of 10, is that a appropriately uh, meritorious trade-off? I'm not, <laughs> that's a good question. So if you want one-tenth of lifestyle for 10 times the population, that's what you're saying is a good thing. That was your- I'm not certain that there's a direct correlation there. I don't think that we need to increase the population of the planet by 10 times. And that by reducing the amount of resources does not automatically equate to additional people. It may happen that way, but it would be sad if it does. So I think the thing we need to look at, and I'll just throw two facts out. If you look at all the tillable land on planet Earth, all the land that we till for planting plants, 80% of it goes to growing grain for cows. 97% of all of the animal biomass on planet Earth is humans and their cows. All the zebra, elephants, wolves, rhinoceros, elk, deer, fox, coyote, rabbits combined is less than 3%. If I were an alien flying past this planet and took a look at what we're doing, I'd just keep flying. I'd wait up a couple hundred years and say, these guys will be gone. I'll come back when it's empty. It doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. And this isn't me saying you should all be vegetarians. It means that we need to all be aware of our impact I continue to support a lifestyle, exactly as you said. It's not a necessity. It's a lifestyle choice. That's and the not... sad thing is that we as Americans have set the standard, meat three times a day. The rest of the world wants to be like us, and they're copying it as quickly as they can. So I know it's not what you came here to hear, but as long as we're on the subject matter. So, Yes, sir. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. once a week is fine if you want to get started on it, you know? Um, you mentioned... 3D printing and soldering, two uh, processes which I would normally go open the window. What do you do to anticipate and uh, handle outgassing, toxic metals, things like that?
still there, just you can use your mic. I'll, I'll fix it this time. We have two good ones. Okay, can you hear me? We're back. Okay, excellent. Yes, thank you. You're, you're absolutely correct. In those, whoa, was that me? That was not me. Okay. In that situation, um, yes, there will be off gassing of fumes and such, 3D printers. And so we are putting in uh, uh, activated carbon filter hoods and, and trying to encapsulate that environment in which those facilities will be operated so that we can clean the air. That's correct. And we will have active, uh, obviously, carbon dioxide, but also VOC sensors. We have a sensor array that we've been working with for the last six months, and we'll be testing that further for the next two months. In fact, Ezio is here from Italy to work on those systems. So I don't have the final answer, but yeah. those are certainly things we're aware of. And the good news is we have Paragon Space Development Corporation in our backyard, and we've worked very closely with them for the last three and a half years. And so when we can't answer something, we drive down the street and they can answer it for us. It's why we have experts uh, on our team. Thank you. I got a brief intro and a quick question. Uh, it was at the very second Mars Society conference that I met some of the original biospherians and learned that the popular media portrayal of it is a failure, uh, is, was false. And I've wanted to visit it ever since. And it so happens, it's a brief detour on my way home. So my question is, is it open today? Yes, Biosphere 2 is open seven days a week, 364 days a year. If I remember right, they open at 9 a.m. They close it. The last tour on Sunday, it starts at 3 p.m. and stops at 4. And it's a fabulous tour. It's, there's so much going on there now today. There's agrivoltaics and photovoltaic studies. And we have a shipping container that's producing 800 heads of lettuce every 17 days in a hydroponic system. Um, and there's a lot of wildlife. There's javelina and deer and fox and uh, bobcats and mountain lions. And it's an exciting place. So I really encourage you to go. I think you'll enjoy it. One of the more publicized issues in Biosphere 2 was the inability to generate enough oxygen long term for subsistence and the fact that oxygen had to be added to the habitat. Is it going to be a focus at some point of SAM 2 to revisit that and see if a self-contained system can be designed that will produce enough oxygen for the long term? And if so, what have we learned from Biosphere 2? What would we do differently the next time around to fix that? Very good question. Thank you. Well stated. I will correct one thing. It's not technically that they couldn't produce enough oxygen. The oxygen was being produced. It's that the oxygen was being taken up by two very heavy reactions. So, in fact, I just met the original soil scientist for Biosphere 2 four days ago, uh, Robert. He visited, and the explanation is that the oxygen was being consumed by the heavy microbial activity in the soil. They handcrafted their soils to make them as rich as possible, particularly for the rainforest region and for the agriculture region. They actually went to a nearby sewage wastewater treatment plant and took that, that, that material and mixed it into their soil to make it as rich as possible so the plants would grow. Makes sense, right? But those same microbial, microbial functions, just like us, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. In addition, it was a double whammy. The concrete was curing and the process of curing concrete. And we're talking about, I don't remember how many cubic feet of concrete. It's a lot of concrete. And that concrete was still wet for years afterwards. Those two functions reduce the, the, the atmospheric oxygen drastically. So today, if you were to seal up biosphere, you wouldn't have those issues and you would be much more readily capable of producing and maintaining that sustainable atmosphere. Now, in the second mission, there's the first mission was two years. The second mission was, was one year. They adjusted things. They took one person out. So there's only seven people instead of eight. And they had synthetic lights over the garden, over the garden, the grow space. And they changed the number of foods from something like 20 food cultivars down to the necessary 12. So there's already lessons learned from the first mission to the second mission. And the second mission was able to sustain that quality of atmosphere just, just a few months after, I think it was six months after the first mission ended. So already lessons learned. Um, but the primary lesson would be, don't make your soil too rich. And we're probably gonna use hydroponics anyway on Mars, at least initially. And don't move into a habitat that has wet concrete. How are we doing on time? Hi. Uh, we're good. We're, we're done. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Whoa.